Today I want to honor the teacher's heart. Because you're here, I know the work we do is important to you. Because you're here, my heart already recognizes your heart. I know it beats primarily for the kids you teach. I know it rejoices and breaks for them. I also know that when we don't take care of it, it dies by inches. And there's nothing like a close call to bring this reality home. Last October, I spent my two-week midterm holiday with grade nine kids and three other teachers on a trekking expedition to Bhutan. Bhutan is a small, landlocked, mountainous nation in Asia, located in the eastern Himalaya mountains, north of India and south of China. It's a breathtaking, beautiful country and considered the happiest place on earth. I felt extremely privileged and lucky to have been sent and I prepared for months. Meeting the kids was the best thing. So the first three days of the trip went extremely well. But on the fourth day, something felt off. We were at 3,200 meters, moving from one campsite to the next. When I felt extremely faint, I was nauseated and sore. Every step hurt like the blood in my legs was boiling. I had very little energy and a lot of denial. The kids were so nice, they would walk ahead and wait patiently from a distance, pretending that that was their normal pace. Our guide, and now my friend Tandon, offered to carry my 35-liter backpack off my back. I said, no, of course not. That's so embarrassing. And then he asked again, and I said, no. But when I could no longer see, and he asked again, I said yes. By the time we reached the next campsite, it was official. I had AMS, or acute mountain sickness. The team was pretty vigilant about checking our oxygen readings, and at 3,700 meters, my oxygen reading dropped from 65, which was already low, to 50 in less than 25 minutes. The lack of oxygen flowing through my body explained everything. The disorientation, the mind-numbing headache, the pain in my limbs, and the fatigue. And the team, they had to act quickly. I had to be evacuated off that mountain fast. One of our kids, Sunny, she held my frozen hand as I cried amidst all this decisiveness. I mean, I was gutted. I had prepared for this trip for months. I didn't want to go down the mountain. I didn't want to leave the kids. So it took six hours, these two kind Bhutanese men carrying me on their backs, two fading torches, a small emergency canister of oxygen, and a lot of patience to get me down that muddy mountain alive. It was late and we were exhausted, but we did our best. I will forever be grateful to Tandon who kept me awake by constantly just keeping me in conversation. Passing out was not an option. Four minutes was all we had to revive a flat line before causing permanent damage to the brain. And CPR on a muddy mountain at night, hours away from health, was out of the question. So I used all my willpower to stay awake and I watched the far light in the horizon inch closer to us. At some point, we reached the ambulance that took me to the nearest hospital in Timpu, still an hour away. I remember laying my head on the pillow, feeling the bumpy road, traversing between sleep and lucidity. All I could do was say thank you with my eyes. I thought I could breathe again. I could finally sleep now. And my heart, it wasn't going to stop today. The next day, after all the tests were done, my heart rate was back to a reasonable rate, and my chest x-ray didn't show any fluid forming in my lungs. They offered to fly me home earlier. I said, no way. I needed to get back up on that mountain. Those kids, they needed to see me alive. And they did. Eventually, I went back up the mountain at a lower altitude, of course, and the reunion was amazing. 
I put the experience behind me and against my friends and family's advice, I went whitewater rafting straight away with the kids. I tucked away a marinade of emotions in a tiny, tiny chamber inside my teacher's heart. I couldn't deal. Of course, I was happy to see the kids. I was so, so glad my heart was going to burst. And I was grateful to every single person who saved my life. But I was also so angry. I knew AMS doesn't discriminate. I knew it wasn't my fault, but I was so frustrated. I felt like my broken body had let me down again. And I know that's harsh. That trip left me different, that's for sure. But it wasn't until I was back in Singapore that it really hit me. It was business as usual. I remember I was sitting in my classroom all alone. Our department meeting was done. I was marking a stack of Google documents when the penny dropped. It was in the silence when I realized I could have died up there. And at 7 p.m., why am I still in school? Since then, I've thought a lot about the teacher's heart. What makes it beat? What makes it flatline? What makes it recover? What keeps it healthy? How do we nurture and protect it? And here's what I've realized. That the heart is magical and resilient. Put a part of it on a dish and it will keep on beating. That the teacher's heart, it will continue to beat loudest for what's best for its kids, always. But as a self-regulating magnificent organ, it also needs to take care of itself to stay healthy. It needs oxygen and nutrients supplied by the same blood it pumps out. It needs to honor its own stretch receptors, know its own capacity. If that blood supply doesn't get to the heart, well, it'll die. Why is it then, when it comes to our hearts, we almost always put self-care last, constantly burning the candle at both ends? Why do we tend to put our oxygen mask last when we're told over and over to put it on first? Think about the thing you love, the very thing that makes you a learner, an artist, a designer, or creator. Inside our hearts, there's a tiny chamber with a valve that holds that thing we would do if we had the time and energy. The thing we would start once we were done with that one last paper to mark or report to write. It's the project we reserve for holidays. That novel, that song, the kitchen cabinet to finish, the photo walk, our poetry. You know, the project we hold so close to our hearts, but is always the last thing to be done. Why? Imagine if we were to put that thing first. It could be the shock we need to revive tired teachers' hearts. Finally, we can't do this important job alone. If it takes a village to raise a child, I think it takes a community to keep teachers' hearts healthy. When we take care of each other, our arteries, they stay unclogged. I would never have survived Bhutan without Oli our outdoor ed team leader, or the support system and my friends from school who received me at the end of that intense adventure. I'm not sure how I can do the work I do every day without our English team. These people behind these windows, they help me see inside my heart. They keep it full, and without them, my heart would die. My colleagues, who are now my friends, help me stay a learner and a creator because they're writers and creators and innovators, photographers, artists in their own right, and having my life surrounded by them keeps it extremely full. Every Friday, our head of department, Ian Timms, who's also my mentor, writes me an email reminding me to just write, whether it's for my novel or my short stories or a blog post, whatever. Just as, as long as I put my writing, something so important to me, first sometimes. The support, it's the only sustainable way to keeping teachers' hearts alive. It's also the best way to make sure our kids thrive. So put your hand to your chest right now and feel your heartbeat. Stop and listen for a second and close your eyes. Feel the awesomeness.
whisper, I will take care of you too. So the next time you see a colleague or friend in the hallway, don't just ask, how are you? Instead, ask them, how is your heart? Thank you.